Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for your word. This is the truth. We honor you and your word. We thank you for your word being sown in our heart and mind. Thank you for bringing revelation of truth this night. We thank you for all that you accomplished through it. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated, if you would. We've been sharing a series of messages on many different subjects exposing false teaching in the body of Christ. And we're going to continue on that tonight. And this morning kind of was a, a preview on some areas that leading up to what we're going to deal with somewhat tonight. And we talked about, especially this morning, we got into about the false teachings about prophetic things and the things that are going to be coming with the second coming of Jesus Christ. We pointed out from Daniel's 70 weeks that the 69 and a half weeks have elapsed of the 70 weeks, which is God's dealings with the Jews. And there is not one week left, a seven-year tribulation that almost everybody teaches out there. It is a lying teaching. It is false. We pointed out that 69 weeks were until Messiah the Prince when he began his ministry, and he ministered for three and a half years. In the midst of that week, he was cut off. So 69 and a half weeks have elapsed. There's only one half week left. There is no seven-year tribulation that almost everybody teaches out there. It is a false teaching. It is a lie. It is only three and a half years, as we pointed out. We also talked about the subject of the rapture of the church. And if you weren't here, you would need to hear this, these points that we brought forth, pointing out the false teaching of the pre-tribulation rapture. Now, if you have believed that, uh, I encourage you to get the message and you will see clearly showing that that, false, that is a false teaching. Unfortunately, that has gone forth widely in the body of Christ. And we also mentioned about the teaching of the imminent return of Jesus and how Jesus could just come back at any time, which has been touted by people forever. And they keep on thinking that Jesus is coming back any time and never come to pass. Now, why are they thinking these things? They have not understood the scriptures where it says about not knowing the day or the hour. When it speaks about not doing, knowing the day or the hour, that doesn't mean about not knowing the time. It's talking about not knowing exactly what it says, the day or the hour. And what is that speaking of? Is it this day or is it that day? And what hour of the day is it? Because it's all speaking about the Feast of Trumpets, which is celebrated by Jews throughout history for two days because they don't know which day the Feast of Trumpets is going to fall upon because it's the seventh Hebrew month, the first day, and the first day occurs at the first sliver of the new moon, and you don't know which time it is. And so that is important to understand that the speaking of the Feast of Trumpets, which is the second coming of Jesus Christ, the rapture of catching up of the church to meet the Lord in the air. We did point out about how Jesus has fulfilled the first four feasts on the exact day of the seven feasts of the Lord. You must also, if you've not heard teaching on the feasts, it would be good for you to hear those messages that I've done in the past. They're not talking about Old Testament things. They're talking about the feasts of the Lord that were holy convocations, meetings, proclaiming what was going to happen as far as the types pointing towards Jesus Christ, who's the fulfillment of all the feasts. The first feast, the Feast of Passover, was the very day that Jesus was on the cross and became sin. The Feast of Unleavened Bread, which was the putting away of the leaven, which is a type of sin, is what Jesus did in the three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, putting away the sin. And then the Feast of First Fruits was those who now were the first fruits of the replanting of the earth, which is those who are now born from the dead, who have come into relationship with God, which is what had to happen because all men were dead spiritually because of the sin of Adam. And so because of that, the first fruits, Jesus was the first born from the dead. The Old Testament saints got born from the dead as well. And Jesus went up on the very day of first fruits to pour out his blood on the mercy seat in heaven, having accomplished eternal redemption for us. He fulfilled it on the exact day, which is on the morrow after the Sabbath. And then 50 days later was the Feast of, the Feast of, um, uh, the Day of Atonement, which is when the Holy Spirit was poured out and that began the church age. 
And that is important to understand that Jesus fulfilled all four of these exactly on the day. Well, if he fulfilled those four on the day, what about the other three? He's going to fulfill those on the exact day as well. And what are they? They, are the, they all speak of the second coming of Jesus. The Feast of Trumpets, the rapture, catching up of the church. Day of Atonement, which is on the tenth day of the seventh month. And that is the Day of Judgment, when the judgment will come on, the final judgment on the nations, when they are going to, they're going to be, the judgment will happen at the Battle of Armageddon, and that's, that's the Day of Judgment that God has set from the very beginning. And then the Feast of Trump, Feast of Tabernacles, which is God coming to tabernacle among us, which is going to be the millennial reign of Jesus. The beginning fulfillment of tabernacles was when Jesus was born. He was born at tabernacles, not on December 25th. It's all a lie. He was born at the time of tabernacles. And then we see that he now is going to establish his millennial reign, which is what tabernacles is all about after he has brought the judgment that is going to come on the world. Now, the teaching out there has been forever that there's going to be an imminent return of Jesus, he, which means he can come at any time. That's what everybody teaches out there. It's false, and people have been looking at it forever. It's important that we see, which we're going to look at tonight, about the exact timing of the Lord and how he fulfills things exactly on the day. We've already mentioned some of it, but you're going to see more. Second Peter 2.1, as we've been mentioning, as we begin these messages, there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. And I hate to always be proclaiming this, but it's the truth. There are false prophets and false teachers out there all over the place in the body of Christ. Evidence of the false teaching. We have all different doctrinal stands on all different kinds of subjects all over the place. Well, there's only one truth on them. So what in the world has happened? We got all kinds of people that have gotten false teachings they got half truths and half lie, which, of course, still makes it a lie, and they have been deceived. False teaching has to be exposed, and the truth has to come forth. And this, of course, is what was proclaimed in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. The Spirit speaketh speak expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits, that's deceiving spirits, and doctrines of devils. A doctrine of the devil is any doctrine that's contrary to the truth. It could be a half-truth and half-lie. Nonetheless, it's a doctrine of the devil. And these things need to be exposed, and we've talked about many different subjects in the past eight, uh, eight or nine messages that we've brought forth on this. Now, regarding this imminent return, it is all a lie. And it is important for you to understand the exact timing of the Lord so you know what's going to happen down the line. We see... Beginning in Genesis, we'll go back to Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, when God created the heaven and the earth, as it says in the King James, but that's not really the best translation because this is a phrase in the Hebrew. In the beginning of God's preparing the heavens and the earth, that's what it really means, or as the Tanakh says, when God began to create the heaven and the earth, talking about him bringing, getting ready to bring this into being. The earth was without form and void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and he began to bring things into being. And how does God do everything? He does it through his word, doesn't it? He speaks his word, and it brings things into being. God said, let there be light, and there was light. And what do we see? It saw the light that was good and divided the dark light from the darkness, he called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. Now, as you go through creation, after he finished, he spoke the next one into being, and it was the second day, and then the third day, and the fourth day, and all these things. These are literal days because it says the evening and the morning. So there were six days of creation, as we see. And when God had finished the six days of creation, when he'd finished all this, he saw everything that he'd made, was, behold, it was very good. The evening and the morning were the sixth day. Then we see on the seventh day, it says, Thus the heavens the earth were finished, all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made. He rested on the seventh day from all the work which he had made. So six days something was made, seventh day rest. 
What's this all pointing towards? It's pointing towards the time of the existence of the earth. Because in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, it says this, Beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. So a day is as a thousand years. How many years have there been of man's history? There have been nearly 6,000 years that have been completed. A day is a thousand years. There were 4,000 years till the time of Jesus Christ. Then there's 2,000 years, which is the church age. And then the 7,000 year period, seventh day period, is the time of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Now, we need to understand what has happened. In Genesis chapter 1, when God made man in his own image, after his own likeness, in Genesis 1, 26, he gave him dominion. He gave him authority and rule. He was to rule and reign with authority and have dominion in the earth. Now, unfortunately, he did not continue to do what God told him to do and transferred this over in the hands of Satan. Now, we must realize that when God did this, he actually gave the earth into the hands of man for a period of time. It's in Psalms 115. We see in verse 16, he says this, The heaven, even the heavens, are the Lord's, but the earth hath he given to the children of men. He has given it to the children, or the sons, this really means, of men. So he gave it into the hands of man to rule for six days, which would be a 6,000 year period that man has a right to rule. And he put him in the garden, told him he was responsible to dress it and to guard it. Of course, he didn't do that, unfortunately, and gave place to Satan who came in after the fall of man. And not only did man die spiritually, being separated from God because of his disobedience and partaking of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which he was forbidden to, but also the authority that was given unto man was transferred into the hands of Satan. Now, we see also in Exodus chapter 20, man was given this position, given this authority over the earth and he says in Exodus 20, verse 9, Six days you'll labor and do all thy work. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, daughter, manservant, maidservant, cattle, stranger that's within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, in them is, and rested the seventh day. Now, there's 7,000 years of man's history. 6,000 years is man now who is going to be ruling in the earth. But the seventh one is not a time when he's not going to be. It's a time when the Lord is going to be ruling. It's a time, Sabbath refers to rest, and it refers to the fact that man is not going to be ruling during this particular time, this seventh day period. So there's six days, which are 6,000 years. And this is actually a period of time that man has been least authority in the earth. In Luke chapter 20, we see, it's 20, verse 9, he began to speak to the people this parable, Jesus did. A certain man planted a vineyard and let forth it to husband. The word let forth here means to make a lease, to make le a lease. He let it forth like a lease. Is what the, you look up this word in the lexicons. He made it like a lease to them. So man was leased the earth. In fact, it, even the teaching is the fact in, in the Word of God that the land was not given to them forever because remember that every jubilee after 50 years they would be brought back into their land. They could recover what they had lost. If they had sold something, they would, everything was being restored because it was only like a least period of time. So that's important to understand that 
It wasn't as if man owns the earth. He was leased that for this period of time, which is 6,000 years. Now, of course, what happened at the fall of man, as we mentioned, in Genesis chapter 3, we see verse 6. This is when the woman saw the tree was good for food, pleasant to the eyes, a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. He knew what he was doing. Because the Bible says over in 1 Timothy chapter 2, in verse 14, speaking about the man knowing what was going on, it says Adam was not deceived. He knew what was happening. But the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Adam gave the, the authority that he had into the hands of Satan and submitted himself unto Satan. Of course, what happened at that point in time? He died spiritually immediately. In fact, it didn't just affect him. Romans chapter 5, over in verse 12, says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Every, because everybody was spiritually dead from then on. Spiritually dead men produced spiritually dead children. So now man was in that state. 6,000 years he had a lease. Well, that transferred over into the hands of Satan. The authority was given unto him. And now he was now in charge of the earth for the 6,000 year period. Jesus, Satan even acknowledged this in the temptation in Luke chapter 4, when we look at the temptation in verse 6, one of the things that he said to Jesus, the devil said to him, All this authority will I give thee and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me. When was the authority in the earth delivered unto him? When Adam sinned and submitted himself to the devil and gave that authority into his hands. This is a temptation, of course. Of course, Jesus didn't fall for any of the temptations and overcame all these things. And what, what did Satan become? It speaks here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4. It calls Satan, the King James says, the God of this world, but that's not a correct translation. The word world is aeon, which means age. He is, as Young's brings out, he is the God of this age the particular age, which would be the time of the age up until the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. So he is the God of this age where the least was in force, and now he became in that position of authority in the earth. He also, because of man submitting unto him, he became the spiritual father of mankind. Satan did. We know that from the statement that Jesus said in John 8, verse 44. He said to the religious people, you are of your father the devil. I mean, their spiritual father was the devil. Because spiritually dead men produce spiritually dead children. And the lust of your father you will do. So he's the spiritual father. He's now the ruler. He was not only the god of this age, but he also was the ruler over the world. We see that from John chapter 14 over in verse 30. When Jesus said, Hereafter, I will not talk much with you, for the prince, the word prince means the ruler, the word archon, which means a ruler, or the one who has, is a chief over it. The ruler of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. Satan became the ruler. It even speaks to over in Ephesians chapter 2, in verse 2. In time past, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince, the ruler, of the authority, the word power is exousia, meaning authority, of the air. So he is the one operating in authority. Why? Because it was transferred into his hands. So what we see is Satan now has been ruling over the world. And because of this lease that was given into his hands, this is why, why didn't God get rid of Satan right away? He couldn't. He'd be violating things according to law because he made a lease to man. That's why it has to go through the 6,000 year period. Now, when did this 6,000 year period begin? It began at the very time that was the beginning. The beginning when everything started 
we see when it speaks of the beginning, Proverbs chapter 8, verse 23, you said, I was set up from everlasting from the beginning. The beginning is this word roshe in the Hebrew. This means the beginning or the something that's the head, this begins something. So, set up from everlasting, from the beginning, and ever the earth was at the very beginning. We even see over in several places, using this particular word, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, over in verse 11, it says, He's made everything beautiful in his time. He also he has set the world in their hearts so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning, Roche, to the end. He's the one that began this whole, whole work. And of course, God was bringing instruction to man throughout this time of his word. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 21 says, Have you not known? Have you not heard? Have not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? This is the beginning when everything started. From the foundations of the earth when he brought everything into being. We also see in Isaiah chapter 41, talking about this beginning, verse 4, Who hath wrought and done it? In Isaiah 41, 4, calling the generations from the beginning. The generations began from the beginning. I the Lord, the first and the last, I am He. So these generations began from this particular time. And we see in verse 26, we come down here. Who hath declared from the beginning that we may know? Again, this is all God. There, see, there was a beginning. The beginning was the first day that everything started. Now, the same word for beginning that we've seen, Roche, there is a scripture that m indicates that there is a beginning and it is as far in relating to time. In Ezekiel chapter 40, verse 1. He speaks here about the five and twentieth year of our captivity. In the beginning of the year, there's a beginning of the time. This is again the word Roche. This is all referring to the beginning of the creation, the beginning of the year, the beginning of God's bringing forth the earth and all the things that happen. And so there's the beginning of the year. And what is the beginning month? Is there a beginning month? Yes, there is. So we can know the time of the year when the beginning was. Exodus 12, verse 2. He said, This month shall be unto you the beginning, Roche, of the months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. And this is talking about the first month of the year, which is the month Nisan, which is the time that would be from our calendar, would either be in March or April, because God's calendar is a lunar calendar. But this is the beginning. So the beginning of creation, the beginning about the earth, the beginning of everything, began on Nisan day one. That's when everything started. The first day of the first month has importance to God. It's when everything began. But also we even see in Genesis chapter 8 and verse 13, came to pass in the 601st year in the first month, that's the beginning month, in the first day of the month, that'd be the same time, many years later, that the waters were dried up from off the earth, and Noah removed the covering of the ark, and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. Otherwise, after all man's wickedness, and God decided he was going to destroy man because of his wickedness, he got, this was all done and finished by that time. So the flood came, and all was finished, at by that time, and then now we come to the first day of the first month, the flood had been finished. We see another case, is Exodus chapter 40, verse 2. On the first day of the first month, thou shalt set up the tabernacle, the tent of the congregation. The tabernacle, the tent of the congregation, where God's presence would come and be manifested. And so as they brought this forth, as it says, see, God does things on exact days. Verse 17, it came to pass in the first month and the second year. On the first day of the month, the tabernacle was reared up. Now it was set up. 
And this is where the presence of God began to manifest. A cloud covered the tent of the congregation. The glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. God manifest His presence in the tabernacle on the first day, the first month. We see another scripture regarding this. The point being is that God does things at specific times on specific days. 2 Chronicles 29, verse 3. He, in the first year of his reign, in the first month, opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. The first month. He was going to bring the repair. And this all, all speaks of the repair and the restoration which he wanted to bring of the temple, which is all pointing towards you and me, this work that he does. And it's interesting, 2 Chronicles 29, 17 says, they began on the first day of the first month, showing God does things at specific times. To sanctify, uh, and on the eighth day of the month, they came to the porch of the Lord, so they sanctified the house of the Lord, which is pointing towards who? You and me, the house of the Lord. So God began to repair sanctified and removed all the filthiness and got all the evil out the first day of the first month, which is all of the temple being cleansed, which is all pointing towards you and I being cleansed. God does these things because he's pointing towards things that are important from his standpoint. He does things specifically on a specific day. He does not do things arbitrarily. He does things specifically on specific days. Ezra chapter 7 verse 9. For upon the first day of the first month began he to go up from Babylon. The first day of the fifth month came to Jerusalem. When they came out of the captivity, they left Babylon. And when was it? The first day of the first month. That's the time when they came out of the captivity and then they were being sent back so that they were going to be able to restore the city of Jerusalem, which began the 483 years that we talked about this morning of the time of the 69 weeks, of Daniel 69 weeks until Messiah the Prince began. Ezra chapter 7 indicates when this all began. Verse 21, even I, Zer uh, even I, Artaxerxes the king, do make a decree to all the treasures which are beyond the river that whatsoever Ezra the priest, the scribe of the law of God of heaven, shall require of you is to be done speedily. And what was this requirement? This is all that was given on the first day of the first month. That they, Ezra, after the wisdom of thy God, is set in hand, set the magistrates and the judges, that they may judge all the people that are beyond the river, all such as know the laws of thy God. You teach them that know them not. Whosoever will not do the law of thy God and the law of thy king, let judgment be executed speedily upon him, whether it be into death or banishment or confiscation of goods or imprisonment. What's that? That's establishing law and establishing that which is going to judge a city and rule. So this is talking about the rule of Jerusalem that was established. And we pointed out that, if you were not here this morning, we'll just briefly bring up one of the points that we talked about. Daniel 70 weeks is important in regarding the work of God in the Jews. He determined that there were 70 weeks, Daniel 9, 24, were determined upon thy people and also upon the holy city to finish the transgression, make an end of sins, make reconciliation for iniquity, bring in everlasting righteousness, seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Who did all these things? Jesus did. When he came and he paid the price, he was made sin, he accomplished this work, and he did this work. 70 weeks were determined. Well, when did this begin? Know therefore and understand from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. That was exactly what we saw that Artaxerxes brought forth. That was in, it, back in 458 B.C. From the going forth of the commandment to restore unto Messiah the Prince, which is when he began to operate in his ministry because as the ruler, he began to preach the kingdom of God and he began to execute rule and reign as he began to destroy the works of the enemy, cast out the demons, heal the sick, show forth that he, he brought forth the, the, all the things that he was going to do, bringing forth the rule and the reign, the kingdom of God beginning to come into manifestation. It was seven weeks and three score and two weeks. Weeks are weeks of years. 
Seven times seven is 49 years. That was from the time of, in 458 BC, 49 years took it down to 409, which is the time when Malachi's ministry ended, and he was the last prophet that was speaking to the Jews. Remember, this is to the Jews. From that point on, there was what's called the silent years. There was no prophet who, from God that was speaking to Israel. There was a silent period. And the silent period was the 62 weeks. 62 times 7 is the 434 years. The 434 years plus this, 400, this 49 years is 483 year period, which is what? The 7 plus the 3 score and 2, which is 62. So that is 69 weeks. That began on 408, 4, at 458 B.C. And you go 483 years, God is exact in what he does. You must understand there's no zero year. If we take 458 B.C. and we go 457 years to 1 B.C., now we have 457 years of that. From 1 B.C. to 1 A.D. is one year, because there isn't any zero year. So that would be 458 years. If we go another 25 years, which brings us to the 483 year period, 25 plus 1 A.D. brings us to 26 A.D. That was precisely the time when Jesus began his ministry. God does things exactly on the day, and that is important to understand. He does things at set times. And then he ministered for three and a half years, which is one half of the week, the 70th week. And we pointed out today that there isn't a 70th week left, as most everybody has taught, meaning a seven-year tribulation period of God's dealing with the Jews. It's a lie. Why? Because Jesus ministered for three and a half years after the 69 weeks. So how many years are elapsed? 69 and a half weeks are elapsed. There's only one half week left, which is three and a half years. Now, if we see this is important because God does things at exact times. The flood was finished. God manifests his presence in the tabernacle repair and sanctification of the Temple of Solomon, pointing towards the work to be done in the church, the decree from Artaxerxes to bring forth Jesus. All these were from the first day, the first month. God does things exactly on time, and he does things at specific times. God does things at set times. Let's look at some scriptures that show this forth in addition to this. Genesis 17, verse 21. He said, to God saying to Abraham, My covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. A set time, an appointed time. It wasn't just some arbitrary time. God did does things at set times. Chapter 18, verse 14. He says, Is anything too hard for the Lord at the time appointed, the set time? I'll return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. So it's going to happen. It's going to happen exactly as I say at the set time. Well, we come down to chapter 21. The Lord visited Sarah as he said, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived, bared Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken to him. It wasn't just whenever things happened. It was a set time that God did these things. Another place, Exodus chapter 12. This is also important for you to understand. God does not just do things arbitrarily. Everything is done at its set times. We see in Exodus 12, verse 41. It came to pass at the end of the 430 years, remember they were going to be in Egypt for 430 years, God had said that, and it exactly happened. Now, did it happen just sometime around then? No, it happened right to the T of the exact day. Look what it says. Even the selfsame day it came to pass that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. The exact day. God's not late. He's on time. Everything was exact. When we see Leviticus, as we were mentioning earlier, all of these feasts, these are the feasts of the Lord. Leviticus 23, verse 2. Speaking to the children of Israel, say unto them concerning the feast of the Lord that you proclaim to be holy convocations. These are my feasts. 
and you are to proclaim these, the feasts of the Lord, that be proclaim in their seasons, the set times when they occur. And we always do that. Remember, he fulfilled the first four on the exact day. And the last three, which is the Feast of Trumpets, the second coming of Jesus, the rapture of the church, the Day of Atonement, which is the judgment that's going to come, the final judgment uh, is going to uh, come on these nations, and then tabernacles, they all are going to occur on the exact day. Now, another thing, Israel did not obey the Lord, and because of that, that's why they were sent into Babylonian captivity for 70 years. In fact, Daniel even understood this. He got the understanding of this from the writings of Jeremiah. Daniel 9.2 In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet. He understood by looking at Jeremiah's writings that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. The city and also the people went into captivity, into Babylon, for exactly 70 years. You know, they weren't walking in the ways of the Lord. After they came out from that, did they do the right things that they were supposed to do? No. The reason they, it was because they were not keeping the seventh year Sabbath of the rest of the land as they were supposed to. Well, they continued to do this. Well, that was a mistake, and God, of course, is going to bring judgment for those who do not follow his ways. And it's in Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 3. This is what he said to Ezekiel. Moreover, take thou unto thee an iron pan, set it for a wall of iron between thee and the city, set thy face against it, it shall be besieged. Thou shalt lay siege against it. This shall be a sign to the house of Israel. Lie also upon thy left side, and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it. According to the number of the days that thou shalt lie upon it, thou shalt bear their iniquity. For I have laid upon thee the years of their iniquity according to the number of days, 390 days. 390 days, so thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. When thou hast accomplished them, lie again on the right side. That was, for, that was for the Israel with the northern tribes. He says, lie again on this right side. Thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah forty days. I've appointed each, the, each day for a year. So there were 430 years. 390 plus the four. The, three, the, four, uh, be the 430. Of the 430 years of punishment, 70 of those had already been served in Babylon. There were still 360 years that were left. The punishment, 360 times seven, the number of years, was 2,520 years of judgment. Well, the Babylonian captivity went from 606 to 536 BC. That was when they came out, but the captivity was not over for, is for them. They came out of that bondage, but as far as them to be able to be restored to their nation, it wasn't going to happen. So, from the 536 B.C., if you take and you add up these time, this whole period of time, which would be the 2,520 years of judgment, and the way God figures it is by 360 day years for the, according to the prophecy, 12 days, 12 months, each month being 30 days. You take the 2,520 times 360 days for each year. That's 907,200 days of judgment, which is 2,483 years, 9 months, and 21 days. If you take the day when they were released from, from Babylon and you go that far, where does that bring you to? It ends up on May 14, 1948. What happened? That's when Israel was able to become a nation again. Why couldn't they become a nation again? Because they were under God's judgment. After the judgment was released, they became a nation on that very exact day. God does things on the Razak today. If people would have been understanding things, 
at that point, they also would have understood when they were going to get Jerusalem back. Because it was not only to the people from the nation, but also was to the city. Well, what happened with his city? Well, the city, remember, the city got destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar in 587 B.C. This is 19 years after when they went into the captivity, which was 606 B.C. Well, 19 years after 1948 brings you to what? 1967. What happened in 1967? In June 7, 1967, that's when they were able to reclaim Jerusalem because they could not get it because they were still under the judgment of God until this particular time expired. Showing God does things exact. That's why they couldn't. They don't understand this. But this is the truth. They were under judgment why they couldn't become a nation. They were under judgment why they couldn't get Jerusalem back until the period of time had been elapsed. Now, God does things exactly. Let's look at New Testament scriptures that show things this forth. The demons know that God does things exactly, in a sense. We even see the testimony here of a demon speaking. In Matthew 8, 29, when he's you know, coming to cast this demon out, and behold, they, talking about the demons, cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of God? Art thou come to, hither to torment us before the time? They knew there's a time when they're going to be tormented because the judgment was already set upon them. And what do you do? You're coming to, to cast us out and torment us. They didn't understand this part, but they did know that there was going to be a set time when they were going to be tormented. The word time is the word kairos, which refers to a fixed, definite time, a specific time. There is a specific time. When is that going to be? When the 6,000 years are up, which is the time of the end of the lease that man had on the earth that Satan got a hold of, of course, because it was given into his hands. We see in Matthew chapter 26, Verse 18, he said, Go into the city to such a man, and say unto him, The master saith, My time is at hand. This is Jesus speaking here. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. Otherwise, he says, My time's at hand. Otherwise, my time's going to be fulfilled. What time? The specific time for him now to keep the Passover when he was going to become the Passover lamb on the 14th day of Nisan which was the Passover day. Notice what Jesus' testimony was. My time's at hand. This fixed, definite time is now. God's going to do things exactly on time. They just don't happen arbitrarily. In Mark chapter 1, verse 15, this is when Jesus was going forth here, and Jesus came preaching the gospel, the kingdom, saying the time... This fixed, definite time, again, the same word, is fulfilled, or the fulfillment has been the time, more literally it says in the Greek. This is why Young is, Young is so good. And he says, fulfilled hath been the time. The time's been fulfilled, which is what? The time up to the time of Messiah the Prince, remember? At 483 period, you know, of, of the 69 weeks. Fulfilled's been the time. Now it's the time when Messiah the Prince is coming on the scene. And the reign of God has come. That's right. Now the rule and the reign of God comes forth. Specific time. Couldn't come before and doesn't come late either. Luke chapter 19, verse 44. He shall lay thee even to the ground, and children within thee. They shall not leave in thee one stone upon another. It's talking about the temple at Jerusalem. Why? Because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. The Jews should have known when Jesus was coming because of the prophecy of Daniel with the, all the, the 69 weeks. They should have known it. They could have added it up from 458 with Artaxerxes' decree and seen exactly what was happening. They should have known the time. But you didn't know the exact specific time of thy visitation. <laughs> Big mistake. Also, how long is the church age? 
we point, pointed this out this morning, it's two days or 2,000 years. It began 30 AD. Now, at the time, from then on, we see that Luke 21 is talking about the end times. And it says, just like Matthew 24 and Mark 13 and Luke 21 are end time chapters. It says, they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. Talking about what happens to the Jews. And Jerusalem shall be drawn, trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Which was the penalty that was upon them until they could become a nation again. Which we already mentioned. That's why these things, the times of the nations were, had to be fulfilled. And this is, again, the specific, fixed, definite times. We even see that God had an angel come down at a specific time. How did they know when the time was? Because they understood God did things at a specific time when he came down to trouble the waters. In John chapter 5, an angel went down at a certain season, a certain fixed definite time, same word, into the pool and trouble the water. And whoever first would get in was made whole of the disease that he had. In John chapter 7, this is speaking... Jesus here at the time of the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, what's the Feast of Tabernacles all about? That's going to be the fulfillment of Jesus coming to tabernacle among us, which is the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. So, the Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. And we come down, they wanted him to go up there to this. And he, he said that he was, they were telling him he should go up there and show himself to the world, but they really weren't believing. They were just saying this to him. They didn't, his brethren didn't believe. In verse 6, Jesus said to him, My time is not yet come. Otherwise, my time for the fulfillment of this is not yet come. Because it wasn't the time for Jesus to come and do this. This was going to be at a later time, the specific time. We also see in Acts chapter 17, verse 26. He hath made one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all, all the face of the earth and has determined the times before appointed. God determines the set times. It has been set and he's going to fulfill his word and he's going to do it exactly on the time. In fact, Many people always trying to figure out who's the Antichrist they've been talking about. Is this president or this leader or that? They've been doing it forever. They're wasting their time. If they'd have read the scriptures, they'd have known that that is just silliness on their part. Because, look what it says. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 6. We know what withholdeth that he, talking about the Antichrist, might be revealed in his fixed and definite time. He'll be revealed in the fixed, definite time when he's going to come on the scene and begin to rule for the three and a half years. Why are people trying to figure this out forever and ever and ever and all these crazy things and writing all these books and stuff? You know, it's a bunch of wasted time because it wasn't the time. This time, he'll be revealed in his time. He's not going to be revealed before, so are you going to know it before? No. He's going to be revealed in his specific time It'll come forth. Now, at the same time, has God spoken to the church and brought revelation of things? Sure he has, through the scriptures of all the times and the seasons. First Thessalonians 5, 1. But at the times, this is just general time, and the seasons, which are these fixed and definite specific times, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. It's already been told them. They already knew all about it. You know yourself, yourselves know perfectly the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. When they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. For you, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day, when he comes, shall overtake you as a thief. Otherwise, they, we know when the day is going to be. Because we already know it's coming. We know all these things are going to happen because we understand the days. At specific times. Oh, everybody else teaches there. Well, we don't know any of these things at all. They don't understand the scriptures. If they understood the scriptures, they'd understand that God does things at specific times. Revelation 
chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, we'll just look at one verse here a moment, we'll be back here at a later time. It says in verse 12, Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth, of the sea, for the devils come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he has but a short time, fixed, definite time. He knows at the end of the 6,000 years, he's going to be kicked out of the heavens. It's exactly what's going to happen. And he's going to be down for his three and a half years, and he's got a short time. And the Antichrist is going to operate. Satan's going to enter into him and rule and reign during this. We know these things are going to come to pass. Now let's go back to what we missed, some things we mentioned today that are important to understand. Remember, there's six days, 6,000 years of man's existence, the least given to man. And this is the period now that Satan is able to rule and reign. Now when Jesus came to raise Lazarus from the dead. As we pointed out this morning, there is an important revelation, not just talking about the physical time when he came to do this. It has a much deeper revelation. Because there were four days from the beginning until Christ came, which is 4,000 years. John chapter 11, verse 17, when Jesus came, he found that he'd lain in the graves, talking about Lazarus. And Lazarus is a type of man who's spiritually been dead for how long? 4,000 years, four days. He'd lain in the grave four days already. The four days are a spiritual revelation of the 4,000 years that man has been spiritually dead before Jesus came on the scene. It was spoken again in verse 39. He said, Take ye away the stone, Martha, the sister of him that was dead. Saith to him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he's been dead four days. Well, that was right. But we're not talking about just four physical days. We're talking about 4,000 days is the real revelation of the word of God that it's bringing forth. Also, when the gospel came to Cornelius' house, it's very interesting that it speaks of this four days. And also, it even speaks of the specific hour when that four days was going to be over, when Jesus was going to accomplish his work. Look what it says. Acts 10, verse 30. Cornelius said, Four days ago I was fasting until this hour. Four, pointing towards the 4,000 years. And at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. And this is when he's telling him how... He, his prayers heard, the gospel's going to come to him, he's supposed to send for Peter to come and teach, pre, give him, teach him words whereby they might be saved. Notice, when did, the, when did the angel show up? At the ninth hour. What's the ninth hour about? That's the very exact same hour when Jesus gave up the ghost, remember? It was at the ninth hour when he gave up his spirit, having been made sin, and went down into hell. It's pointing towards 4,000 years up until this ninth hour when Jesus was crucified. God does things exactly, not just to the day, but to the very hour, to the very minute, to the very second. He does things exactly. Now, four, four days of this 6,000 years, or 4,000 years of the 6,000 years, have elapsed. And Jesus now has accomplished this redemption bringing man out of, see, Lazarus, he was raising him from physical death. But what did Jesus come? He came to raise man from spiritual death unto life, where he gets born again. He's not now. And it began the church age. The church age is two days. We pointed this out again this morning, but we'll bring it to you again. Exodus chapter 19, verse 1. In the third month, why is that important? What is the third Hebrew month? It's Siwan. What is significant of that? That's when Pentecost occurred, which was what? The beginning of the church age. So in the third month, that's when the children, they came out from the land of Egypt and they came out from Pharaoh. Pharaoh is a type of Satan in scripture. Egypt is a type of the world. This is all pointing towards when man, when the gospel was coming to those people alive 
having been delivered out of Satan's authority and coming out of the world, which was, when did the gospel come to those people who were alive? It began on the day of Pentecost, didn't it? The time was the pour, outpouring of the Holy Spirit. That's the third month. Well, we come down to verse 10. And this is the instructions that God said to Moses, and Moses is a type of Christ, which is speaking of the beginning of the church age. He said to Moses, Go into the people, sanctify them today and tomorrow. Well, that's two days. And let them wash their clothes. What is supposed to happen during the church age? People get born again, or to come to the place of being sanctified and holy and washed clean. This is the work of God, working out our own salvation, coming to the place of being holy before the Lord during the two days, which is what? The 2,000 years of the church age. When did that begin? 30 A.D. When does it end? 20, 30 A.D. Where are we at now? 2017 A.D. We are 13 years away. So could Jesus come back today, tomorrow, or whatever, as all these people have been teaching the so-called imminent return? It's all a lie. They don't understand the times and the seasons. They do not understand the times of God. And so they've been going on forever. Every generation in the last several hundred years has always thought that Jesus is coming this one, and they see any kind of cal calamity or problem or war or this or that or things up in the heavens with the planetary alignments and all this stuff. Oh, it means something's going to happen. They understood the timing. They'd know that, no, it's not going to happen. They missed the whole boat. Two days. And what's going to happen then? Be ready against the third day, which would be what? After the 6,000 years are done, because what's going to happen the third day, which would really be the seventh day, because there were four plus two. So what's the third day? For the third day, the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. Jesus is going to come down. The Bible says every eye is going to see him, every ear, every eye is going to see him. They're all going to see him in Revelation chapter 1. It talks about that in the clouds when he comes. This is all pointing towards the second coming of Jesus Christ, which is the trump, feast of trumpets fulfillment, the catching up of the church, the rapture to meet the Lord in the air. It's going to happen exactly on the feast of trumpets. You don't know which day it's going to be or hour because you don't know when the first sliver of the moon, new moon is, which is when the feast of trumpets is going to occur. So, we see another point towards this uh, scripture that points towards this two days, Hosea 6, verse 2. Come, let us return to the Lord, for he, will, he hath torn, he will heal us, he has smitten, he has bind us up. That means he, we judged us, and then we repented, and he got us healed again. Of course, you know, they were smitten. Why? Because they were under judgment because of their continual disobedience. Verse 2, after two days, what two days? The two days of the church age. Because what is happening? God's dealing with the Jews were 69 weeks until Jesus comes. How long did he minister to them? Three and a half years. And he was cut off. That's a half week. So 69 and a half weeks have elapsed. There's still a half week left, which is the three and a half years, which is the tribulation period. As we pointed out this morning, seven-year tribulation is a lie from the devil, deceiving the multitudes. And everybody teaches it. It's a lie. It's three and a half years instead. So the three and a half years, and so when's that going to happen? That's the time when the Jews are going to have one more time of God coming to deal with them in the three and a half years, which parallels the time of the tribulation. But between that, what's the time? There's two days. After two days. So... That's after the 2,000 years of the church age, which were about finished. You know, there's got to be a generation when all these things are going to happen, and we are the generation. 13 years away from the end of the church age. Most people don't understand this, unfortunately. They don't, they're supposed to know the times and the seasons, but they don't. In the third day, he's going to raise us up, and we're going to live in his sight. The gospel is going to come to the Jews. At the beginning of that time when, God's, when Jesus is going to deal with the Jews for that last three and a half years. And we shall know if we 
follow on to know the Lord is going forth prepared as the morning. He's going to come to us as the rain, the latter and the former rain in the earth. That's the double portion outpouring, the end time pouring out of the, of the Holy Spirit coming forth on the end time church as well as on the Jews in the last three and a half years. There's going to be a tremendous outpouring that is going to come. So, what else do we see? This third day is significant. John chapter 2. The third day, anytime you see the third day, perk up your ears and your eyes. This must be talking about something to do with, with the second coming of Jesus. What's going to happen? There was a marriage in Cana. What's going to happen? We're going to be married. The bride, the church, is going to be married to Jesus, the bridegroom, who's going to come for us, which is what the rapture is, the catching up of the church to go to be married unto the Lord there. And the marriage supper of the Lamb is going to occur in heaven during those 10 days in between. Tishri 1, the fulfillment of the Feast of Trumpets. And then when we all come back with him in the final judgment, which is on the 10th day of the seventh month, there's going to be, this is the time when the marriage occurs. The marriage of the Lamb and the Bride, the church. Now, so we see 6,000 years of man's rule, 4,000 years till Christ comes and raises man from spiritual death into spiritual life, two days of the church age to, for the church age coming forth. And when was the beginning of creation? It was Nisan day one. 6,000 years are finished. The lease given to man that was transferred into the hands of Satan finished. What do you think God's going to do exactly on that day? <laughs> you think the devil's going to continue operating and ruling and reigning? No way. The lease is up. You're out of here. If the lease is up, you're vacating, right? The lease is up. It's going to be the end of his time. Now, you must understand Satan's judgment has already been set. If we go back here, the Holy Spirit comes in John 16. When he's come, he's going to reprove the world of three things that are important. Sin, not sins, sin, one sin. Righteousness and judgment. What are we talking about? Of sin, one sin that the world's convicted of, that they believe not on Jesus. They need to receive him and get born again. That's the only thing that stops them from coming into relationship with the Father. Of righteousness, who's the righteous one? Jesus, because I go to the Father and you see me no more. He is the righteous one and the only one who is the Savior of mankind. Of judgment, meaning this has also been accomplished, because the prince of this world is judged, it says, but that's not a good translation because of the tense. The tense, voice, and mood are important. And the tense of the verb is the perfect tense in the Greek. The perfect tense in the Greek expresses action completed in the past with present results at the time of speaking. Action completed in the past with present results at the time of speaking. Meaning, the prince or the ruler of this world, who is who? The devil, has been judged. That's why Young translates it. It's already been done. His judgment has already been set. That's why the demon said, are you coming to torment us before the time? They already know the time, the judgment is. They know when this 6,000 years up, it's over for them. You don't have any rights anymore. You don't have any right in the lease any longer. And you better believe he's going to, God is going to clean house on the works of the enemy. It's going to start in the heavens. Look what it says in Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. There was war in heaven. Well, what's going on? Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. Why? Because the lease is up, you are kicked out of there. Remember, up to this time, as we see, 
The great, great dragon was cast out, the old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. He's cast out on the earth, and his angel were cast out with him. Remember, up to this time, he was the accuser of the brethren, having access throughout the entire church age to have access to accuse us before God of our sins. And he says, now has come salvation, strength, and the kingdom of our God. Because this lease now is up. And the power, or this means authority, exousia, of his Christ. For the accuser of brethren is cast down, which accuse him before our God day and night. He's going to be eliminated. And so, what's going to happen? God's angels are going to attack the devil and all his angels, and they're going to kick them out of the heavenlies, and they're going to be eliminated right away. That's going to happen immediately at the end, at the 6,000 end of this lease. And of course, as we saw the verse er, er, later, earlier, what's going to happen? Verse 12, Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devils come down unto you having great wrath, because he knows he has but a short, specific, fixed, definite time. It's the end for you, buddy. There's 300, or there's three and a half years, 1260 days, 42 months, times time and half a time, three and a half years, which is parallels the final dealings with the Jews the last half week. And that's when Satan is going to be coming down here on earth, as it says, and he's going to have great wrath because he knows, but he's going to have a short time. This is all going to happen in Nisan 1 because every, that 6,000 year thing is done, he's kicked out. So the wrath of Satan will begin. Now, what's he going to try to do? When the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman that brought forth the man-child. Who was the one? Where did Jesus come from? He came from, you know, being born of a woman who was a Jew. He came under the old covenant. So who's this woman? That's the Jews. He's coming to persecute the Jews. To the woman, though, was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly in the wilderness into her time where she's nourished. She's going to be nourished for a time, times, and half a time from the face of the serpent. Otherwise, you're going to be protected. What's that? That's the three and a half years. Times, time, and half a time. We pointed that out from Daniel, and it's also shown in here as well. So, this 1260 days from Nisan 1 brings us to where? Nisan's the first month on the Hebrew calendar. Three and a half years, and we go six more months, we come to what? The seventh month, first day. What is the seventh month? Tishri. What happens on the seventh month, first day? Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets fulfillment will happen, and the rapture of the church will occur. They're going to be protected up to this time. What else is going to happen? Well, the devil is going to get into the man of sin. The Antichrist is going to be on the scene. Revelation 13, 5. He doeth great wonders so that he makes fire come down from... Or no, I'm sorry. Verse, when I get to that? Verse 5. There was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies and of power. This means authority was given unto him by the devil is going to give him this, see, to continue 40 and 2 months. This is talking about the Antichrist, the man of sin, the Antichrist. He's going to be ruling for these 42 months, which is what? The 1260 days. All these things are going to happen precisely as God says. Revelation 11, 2. The court which is without the temple, leave out, measure it not, is given unto the Gentiles, the whole city, so they tread underfoot 40 and 2 months. Jerusalem's going to be under control for the 42 months of the Antichrist as well. He's going to come, and he's going to, they are going to be taking control of that. So, Nisan 1, Satan's going to be cast out of heaven. The lease is done for him, begins the persecution of the women in the church. He's going to, they're going to, women will be protected. Those people who are walking with the Lord will be protected because he will keep those ones that are walking with him from evil. The rest of them are probably going to get martyred out. It's going to happen. The Bible says so. Can I be protected? Yes, if you meet all the conditions. We've talked about that in the past. We did messages on that in order to be protected. 
From Nisan 1 to Tishri 1, the Israel's nourished, protected for the 1260 days. The Antichrist is going to rule these 1260 days. All of these things are going to happen. Precisely, exactly as God says. So, is the imminent return of Jesus true? Which means it could happen any time, any day. It's a lie. It's been going on. Almost every prophecy teacher teaches that out there. Almost every church believes that the imminent return could happen any time. It's all a big lie. They don't know the times. It's going to happen, and it's going to happen precisely on the day of the Feast of Trumpets. Well, we don't know the day or the hour, they said, remember? But, well, we don't know the day or the hour, but what are we talking about specifically? Remember, we brought this up, but we ought to bring this up again for those of you who weren't, just before we conclude here. Mark, chapter 13. This is one of the scriptures where it talks about the day and the hour thing. Of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Jesus doesn't know it. The angels don't know it. None of them know it whatsoever. Notice it says day and hour. It doesn't talk about, you won't know the time. It just says the day and hour. God's word means what it says. You won't know the day and you won't know the hour. And so he says, take heed, watch and pray. You'll know not what the time, the fixed, definite, specific time. Who knows it? Jesus doesn't even know it. Only the Father knows it. He knows it exactly when it's going to be. And then he says, For the Son of Man is a man taken a far journey or left his house. Who's that? Jesus. What's his house? The church. He's the cornerstone of the church. Where'd he go? Back to heaven. Gave authority to his servants. That's the church. And to every man his work. We all have a work to do. What's our work? Work out our own salvation with fear and trembling and do the works of God and preach the gospel and reach people to help them come to the Lord. Commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore, for you know not when the master of the house cometh. That's the second coming of Jesus when he comes back. And notice what it says. Remember it says you don't know the day or the hour. Now notice what it says. You don't know when he's coming. Is he coming at even? Is he coming at midnight? Is he coming when the cock's crowing? Or is he coming in the morning? Evening would be like 6 p.m., sometime up to, to there in that time. Midnight, that would be the second watch time. Cock crowing, that would be the third watch time, but that's the next day now. Or in the morning, this would be the fourth watch. This cock crowing was the third watch. It's used for referring to the third watch of the night. Or in the morning, and this word means referring to the fourth watch, which is from 3 o'clock to 6. So, is he coming from 6 to 9? Is he coming from 9 to 12? Or is he coming from 12 to 3? Is he coming from 3 to 6? Well, what does that tell you? Well, if he comes in even or midnight, that would be the first two. That would be one day. Suppose it's the cock crowing in the morning. Well, that's going to be the next day. And do we know the exact hour? No. What did the prophecy say? You don't know the day or the hour. Well, that's exactly what it's talking about here which is what? The Feast of Trumpets. You don't know when the sliver of the new moon occurs. Therefore, all the teaching that says there will never know when Jesus is going to come back, the time, or he could come any time, is all a lie. Do not believe it. Do not listen to those people that tell you that. There's all kinds of teaching out there that is totally false teaching that has gone for it. So, God does things at exact time, and he's going to do things, exact fulfillment. They're going to happen exactly. That's the way it's going to be. And nothing's going to happen until the church age is over. And when that lease is over, it is going to get wild. It's going to get crazy in the realm of the spirit. There will be an absolute attack against these devils cast out of the heavenlies down to earth. The lease is done. The three and a half years will begin. Satan will get a hold into the Antichrist and everything. Is go he's going to be start carrying out his destructive work. At the same time, Jesus is going to be open. At the beginning of this time, now he's going to be opening up the seals, which is the, the seals of the title deed of the earth. That's what Revelation 5 is all about. 
We're about out of time for now. But the title deed of the earth is what he's going to open up. And who could open it? Only one. The only person who could open it was the one who overcame and conquered and accomplished the redemption. Jesus. He's the one who has the right of redemption, the right of inheritance, and the right for the transfer of authority of all things. He's already done it for man, and now he's going to do it for the earth because he's got to take back the earth, which is what's going to happen. And the opening of the seals are all of his judgments. Anybody tells you, oh, the seals are already open and all these things are happening? Pfft. Rip it up and throw it away. It's a lie. None of it's happened. These people don't know what they're talking about, and they're all over the place. Oh, there's lots of them say, oh, well, the tribulation's starting, or it's going to start this time, or that time, or we're already in it, or we're already in the midst of it. <laughs> don't waste your time listening to them. They don't know the time. It's amazing they don't know the time when the scriptures clearly show the time. So I hope this has helped you to understand God does things exactly on time. So what should you be doing? You should be working out your own salvation with fear and trembling, getting sanctified, getting washed, getting holy. Deal with everything in your life. Be bringing forth fruit, more fruit, much fruit. Be possessing promises, become a partaker of the divine nature. Be walking in the ways of the Lord 100% with the fear of God all your life. Be out preaching the gospel, reaching people with the gospel, doing the work of God. Be involved in warfare intercession and casting out and destroying things in the realm of the spirit in the heavenlies to see God bring what we want. Be casting the demons out of yourself to get cleansed of everything and get set free. Entering into all that God has for us. Doing the total work of the Lord in our life and through us to reach others. That's what you should be doing. If you're not doing that, what are you doing? You're wasting your life. Your wheel. Also, you're preparing for reigning in the life to come because whatever you do now is going to determine what's going to happen in the life to come because we're all, all our works are going to be checked out and tried by fire to see whether we're going to get rewarded or not. And the guy that's the faithful, good and faithful servant, well done now, good and faithful servant. Have authority over ten cities or whatever it might be because you and I are going to be in the millennial reign of Jesus Christ if we have done what he says. And depending upon what you have done is going to determine where, what position you're going to be, whether you're going to be ruling and reigning or not. So you need to be working out and getting yourself free of everything and learning the Word of God. You should know the Word of God inside and out. Learn your authority, operating, operating in the Spirit in all areas and getting yourself operating as a king, ruling and reigning. Because if you can't rule and reign over you now, are you going to be ruling and reigning in the life to come? No way. Just like it says, hey, if the guy can't rule over his own house, he can't even be, a, he can't be ruling in the church. If you can't rule over your life now, are you going to be ruling and reigning in the life to come? Nope. You've got to be doing what he, get with a program and be focused on what God wants for us all. And all this other stuff, throw it out because it's all a bunch of lies that have been taught. Don't be caught up with all the false teaching out there. Now we know the times. We understand the agenda. And what kind of church is Jesus coming back for? One last scripture, and we'll close with this. A glorious church. Is the church a glorious church yet? No. Who's going to be a part of that? The remnant? Well, that's going to be the ones that do what he says, not the ones... That that's the few, not the many that are just walking the broad way to destruction. What's gonna, what, what kind of church is Jesus going to present to himself? Just everybody who's born again? Nope. He's going to present a glorious church, not having spot, wrinkle, or any such thing that should be holy and without blemish. And also, I said that, I, can't, I have to show you this scripture. Who's going to be coming back with him after the marriage of the Lamb, which means who the ones are going to make it up there to be with him? Those that are with him are called, chosen, and faithful. You have a call of God. You've got to find out all the things you're called to. If you don't know what all you're called to, what are you doing? You have a call on your life. Many are called, but only few are chosen. Well, first, you've got to find out what you're called to. Secondly, you've got to receive the call and enter into the call and act on it and, and walk in the light of it so you'll be chosen. And you've got to show yourself to be faithful. That's what you should be doing in your life. If you're not on board on this, 
you are not going the right direction. God wants us, to, because we understand this, we're going to do this. We are going to walk this walk, and we are going to become a part of the glorious, holy church. The great, perfect man, the full man of the stature in Christ, is going to come forth in these last days. And the church that's going to be one, that's going to be mighty, it'll be a remnant. That means if you're going to be a part of it, we got our work to do. So get working, doing the things that God wants. And don't waste your time listening to any of this garbage that goes on continuously in the body of Christ about he's coming any day and all this kind of stuff that they say. It's all a lie. We understand the exact timing and the seasons that God has set and when he will do these things. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you for the word that brings revelation of the truth. I thank you. I will not be deceived by any of these people again. I understand the times. God does things exactly, and it will be done exactly in fulfillment of the final feast of the Lord. I will be about the work of the Lord to work out my, my salvation, to be called, chosen, and faithful, to be holy, no spot, no blemish, it's going to be holy before the Lord, to be a part of the glorious church presented unto the Lord. I'm working out my salvation and I'm going to be a vessel for God to flow through. I am getting with the program. I will not waste any more time. I will do what God says every day of my life. I will get the word in me. I'm training for reigning in the life to come. Thank you. I've got my orders and I got my bearing set. I'm going to run this race and accomplish everything that God says as he will do it in me as I'm working out my own salvation. Thank you for accomplishing the work in me as I am a doer of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father, for this coming forth. Thank you, Father, for helping every one of us to be in line with your word. We will walk in the light of in the truth. Thank you, Father, for each one being a doer of this word from this day forward and not being caught up in any of these lies any longer. We praise you for much fruit as we're doers of the word from this point forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God.